the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Thank you, Brother Doug and Patsy, for leading us this morning. I invite you this morning to turn in your Bibles to the New Testament book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 1. In a few moments, I begin reading in verse 12. Eva Hesse was a sculptor. She was 34 years old when she died of a brain tumor. A critic once wrote, Hesse may have been shaped by a crisis. Hesse was born in Germany in 1936. Her parents were Jewish. They were separated through the Holocaust. Her mother committed suicide, and now in the prime of her life, Hesse dies of a tumor. Crisis does have a way of shaping us, and it seems like that every blow of the sculptors in many different forms, sometimes it's a loss of health, loss of a friend, a loved one, there's disappointment. Now we have what is called the coronavirus, and we find ourselves just kind of uh, corralled, and, and we have to keep apart, and and we as social people, we're not used to that, and so we're struggling, and, but at the same time, God is using that to, to shape us. And, and so this morning, I, I want us to take a look at the Apostle Paul and his life, and, and here in Philippians chapter 1, <clears throat> Paul, is, uh, Paul is in prison, and uh, he's waiting trial, and he's in prison for preaching the gospel, for believing that Jesus Christ is the only way, the only truth, and the only life, and and he's doing what God had called him to do, and he finds himself in prison, and nothing they'd done particularly wrong, but yet uh, he's in prison, and and Paul now is separated from the church at Philippi, and and so uh, he misses the church, just as I miss you, Southmore, and and they missed him, and 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 it's interesting that Paul is concerned with the church because he's not being able to be with them, but also the church is concerned with the Apostle Paul because he's in prison. And, and the church was concerned, well, well, Paul, they were wondering, is Paul depressed? Is, is he uh, uh, crushed in his spirit? Uh, is he struggling right now because he's in prison? And, and as a matter of fact, Paul was better than most of the people who were free there in Philippi. And, and so Paul writes this letter to encourage them, and he teaches many valuable lessons about life. And so two or three things I want to share with you this morning, church, that as Paul taught the church 2,000 years ago, that's relevant this morning. First of all, I want you to notice as we look in verse 12 of Philippians chapter 1, Paul tells us that life sometimes hammers us. Listen as he writes. He says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, speaking to the church, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Paul was saying, listen, church, this is life. This is reality. Uh, for, for Paul, prison was his reality. And, and he was saying to the church, church, listen, sometimes life just hammers us. And it, and it makes no difference <clears throat> whether you're uh, rich or poor. It doesn't make any difference. You're, you're Baptist or Methodist or Democrat or Republican. It, you know, it doesn't make any difference. Sooner or later, we're going to discover and we're going to experience that life also hammers us. And, and let me just say, church, it, it's really nonsensical for us to think that we're going to get through life without being bruised or broken or experience bad things in our life. That's not reality. <clears throat> God, God, God doesn't put a hedge of protection around us and, and protect us from all the things of this world. Adversity is no respecter of persons. And, and throughout Scripture, God teaches us that, that, yes, sometimes bad things are going to happen to us. Just like Eva Hesse. She didn't do anything wrong, but yet she suffered. Her life ended too early. And yes, 
adversity comes sooner or later to all of us. And how do we respond when that happens? Well, sometimes people blame God, but blaming God is not the answer. L listen again, in, in Job, as, as, as Job's, we, we know how many times Job was hammered over and over again. But, but Job says in Job chapter 5, verse 7, Yet man is born in trouble as surely as sparks fly upward. Job was a great man of God. He was, God just described Job as one of the best of the best of, of his people, and, and, and yet he was hammered over and over again. Again, he says in Job chapter 14, verse 1, Mortals born of woman are a few days and full of trouble. Bad things happen to good people. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 13, listen to Apostle Paul as he writes. He says, as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. It was no secret. Paul, too, was being hammered. He's, he describes his life as, I'm in chains 24-7. He, he's not only confined, but he's restricted. He has very little movement at all. And, and there he is writing to the church to encourage them. And, of course, how can we think of bad things happening to good people? As we can't stop from thinking about the bad things that happened to the Lord Jesus himself. And in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3, the prophet describes the Lord's life. And he writes, he, speaking of Christ, was despised and rejected by mankind a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Jesus knew what it was like to suffer. Yes, life hammers us. Paul is reminding us that this morning. And we asked several questions, but one of the most important questions we asked the Apostle Paul, we, we asked Paul, uh, how do you get through these prison days, this incarceration, these chains? H how are you managing? How do you keep him from losing your mind and going off the deep end? Paul tells us over and over again through Scripture and through his own example of his faith, he has confidence, total confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. What encouragement. Church, listen, as, as you are struggling perhaps this morning and, and the days seem to get longer and uh, it seems like the anxiety, the worry, the stress begins to mount up, listen, keep your eyes on the Lord. Be encouraged through Paul's example and how he tells us, and he tells us like it is. He's not sugar, sugarcoating anything. He's not saying that, yes, everything's going to go away within 24 hours and we're going to get back to normal. He says, no, sometimes life hammers us, and, and we should expect it. We should need to get ready for it. We need to prepare ourselves for it. And, and with God's help, he, he's going to help us to, as we put on the whole armor of God every day to fight this giant, to fight this enemy called this virus. What an example Paul was to us and is to us this morning. He tells us, yes, uh, life sometimes hammers us, but also he tells us that we're not in control. I know for some of us and some of you, and, and even myself, and as I get older, I remind myself that <clears throat> I, I don't like my schedule to change. I like to know what's going to happen today and what's going to happen tomorrow, and, and, and I like a routine, and I like to stay on schedule. And, man, ha how that schedule has gone out the window. And, and our world, our lives, individually as well as collectively, Everything has changed these last few weeks, and we're reminded that we're not in control. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 1, verse 14, he says, And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord. He's saying, I I'm not in control, but, but look at the good things that are happening from this. Because of Paul's witness, people were coming to Christ rather than worrying and fretting and and. And going off the deep end, having a pity party, <laughs> the church is beginning to share the gospel. You see the good that's coming out of Paul's imprisonment. And he says, many others are coming to Christ because of the gospel. And he said, 
And I become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Notice he says, verse 14 again, because of my chains. Day after day, Paul was making the most of his circumstances. And, and he teaches another valuable lesson. He tells us that that outlook determines the outcome. And, and what an attitude that he possessed. And let's just for a few moments, let, let's consider Paul's life. Here he is, not only in a Roman prison. And if you know anything about the ancient prisons, I mean, they're, they're dark and, and they're, they're dingy and they're damp. And, and yes, they're deadly. And here Paul is in this prison. But not only is he in a prison, but he's chained to a guard. 24 hours a day, 24-7, he's chained to a guard. And, and when you think about his life, Paul wasn't chained to a guard. A guard was chained to Paul. And, and every four hours, a new guard would come in. For six times a day, there would be a new guard chained to the apostle Paul. And can you imagine over that period of time? And, and, and Paul, no doubt, he, he was thinking as uh, the guards would change, he was saying to himself, here's another opportunity for me to share the gospel. And, and over and over again, uh, the, the, these, these guards, they're, they're chained to Paul, and, 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 and they're, they're not social distancing. I mean, they're, they're up close and personal, and uh, Paul has a captured audience, and, and he's telling this guard, let me tell you about my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let me tell you how Jesus changed my life. And how now Paul was saying, I am chained to Christ just as you're chained to me. And these guards, they're listening. They can't keep from listening. They can't shut him up. And he's sharing his faith. And no doubt many of them accepted Christ and went out from that Roman prison and out in the community and telling their families, you're not going to believe me what happened. I'm chained to this prisoner. You, you possibly have known Paul and heard of his reputation and how he's this fanatic. He's, he's crazy for Jesus. And he was telling me about Christ. And you can't believe as he's telling his wife and his kids, I can picture my mind. He says, I too have given my life to Christ. And we see that these, these prison guards become the first evangelist and witness. They're in Rome. What an example. And no doubt God's going to give you and me examples and opportunities to share our faith in these difficult days. And because of my chains, can you say that with Paul this morning? Because of my chains, many will come to Christ. The story is told of a crippled boy that was selling pots and pans from door to door. That was pretty common about 40, 50 years ago that there would be uh, men and women, young people usually uh, in the summertime, kids out of school, that they would go and they would share and, and try to sell uh, pots and pans, uh, sometimes uh, Bibles and books and encyclopedias, uh, sometimes vacuum sweepers. And, and this, this boy, he, he was selling pots and pans, and, and he was crippled. And he was at a, a door, and a lady came to the door, and he gave him his sales pitch and said to the lady, would you like to buy these pots and pans? She said, no, I'm, I'm not interested. And, and so the boy walked away. And the lady noticed that, that he was dragging his foot. He was crippled, and she felt sorry for him. He said, oh, oh sorry, uh, come back. I, I, I see you're crippled. said, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll buy some pots and pans from you. And the little boy looked at the woman and said, ma'am, I'm not here to sell symphony. I'm here to sell pots and pans. And then the woman said to the little boy, being crippled must color your life. And he responded and said, yes, ma'am, it does, but I get to choose the color. Paul was in chains. And he was making the most of it. He teaches us that outlook determines our outcome. But also he teaches that pain is inevitable and mercy is optional. And sad to say that during this tough time, and, and I'm not going to minimize it. I've had my moments too. But just for all of us, uh, 
yeah, we, we struggle, and struggle and pain is inevitable during these uncertain times, but, but also misery is optional. And some, sad to say, they, they choose misery. They uh, jump to conclusions. They begin to allow fear to set in, and they say to themselves, well, well the, the world's coming to an end. This must be it. Uh, we're all going to die. We're going to take the mark of the beast if we're going to go buy any groceries. And, and they begin to just to almost just lose control. Paul is saying to the church, listen, you don't have to lose control. Yes, we're separated. Uh, and, and he's not painting this picture that all is well and it's always blue skies and sunshine. It's not a walk in the park. But Paul is saying you, you don't have to be miserable. You don't have to settle for just being doomsday and the world's coming to an end. And, and, and listen, even if the world is coming to an end, God gives us this moment and this hour and perhaps this day and the day an opportunity. And, and we need to make the most of it, just as Paul did in his own life while he was in prison. I read the story of a preacher one day he's out playing golf, and, and he was paired with another fellow, and that's oftentimes a in golfing, that happens. If you don't have a foursome, that they'll connect you with some other guys where you'll have four players at the same time. And so a preacher was was connected with a, a stranger, but yet they became friends. And and he and another fellow was talking about just life. And and he discovered while he's playing golf that that uh, this now his new friend, uh, his golf buddy, uh, that his his wife and and. Uh, his wife had died, and his dad had died in just the last year. And during the course of the round, uh, the fellow told his new friend that how he and his wife had planned and worked hard for years, and, and, and they had a goal of they were going to retire early, about age 55, and, and they were going to have enough money, and they were going to travel the world and do things that they never got to do before. And, and then at age 54, his wife found out she had cancer and before she turned 55 that that she died and then then his dad died and and in the course of the the afternoon well the fellow told uh, told his buddy that he was at one time active in church and, and but no longer he went to church and so his friend said well, well why don't you come to church I you come and let me invite you to my church and he said uh, no, no thank you God and I are not on speaking terms right now. He said, when my wife got cancer and my dad got cancer and I prayed, he said, God didn't, God didn't answer my prayer. And in fact, God let me down. Listen, my dear friend, God doesn't let us down. He is with us and he is for us. But we know that loss and heartache and uncertain times that it, it it can cause us to jump to conclusions and and sometimes the trouble and the sorrow the uncertainties that come our way it it, it leaves us uh, bitter sometimes or angry or fearful or disillusioned but but listen it can cause us to be sweeter to be kinder more humble more gentle and just more loving. Paul was saying to the church, listen, church, you have a choice. You don't have to be miserable. Pain comes our way. It happens sooner or later in our lives. But he says, choose to let this difficult time make you better and not bitter. And last of all, Paul teaches us that that yes, life sometimes hammer us, and, and yes, uh, we're reminded that we are not in control. But listen to Philippians chapter 1, verse 19. And Paul, you, you see the, the confidence that he has in the Lord Jesus and in the gospel. He says, For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I'm sure you've heard by now that 
it's been described that sometimes life is like a tea bag. And, and sometimes uh, you've heard it said that Christians, we're like tea bags. We really know, don't know what we're made of until we're put in hot water. Well, we're definitely experiencing some hot water times. Paul was in his life. And in a crisis, uh, crisis sometimes we, we discover who we are. Uh, it measures our faith. It, it stretches us. We, we especially now having more time to take the long look and not the lean look. And, and we look and, and, and we sit back and, and uh, in our quiet time and in our prayer time and our devotion time that, that we, uh, we allow the Spirit of God to examine our lives and, and, and yes, to see what we're made of and to see how, how we're doing in our faith life. A crisis has, has a way of, of shaping us molding us, building our character and our faith. Grammy-winning country singer Naomi Judd, in the prime of her career, discovered that she had an illness that, that took her off the road and, and really took her career away from her and into early retirement. And, and listen how she responded when that happened. She said, this is not my tombstone this is my stepping stone. What, 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 a, what an attitude. What, what, what faith. Listen, church, this is not the end of us. This is not the church's tombstone. And, and, and I know those who are against the church, they're saying, they says, finally, finally, the, the Christians are off the road. They're not attending church on Sunday morning. Listen, this is not the end of the church. This is a stepping stone, and I truly believe in my, in my own heart, Southmore Baptist Church, that, that this is the beginning of, of, of a great era for our church, and, and, and things are going to get better, things get stronger, and, and I can't wait till all this is passed, and we see what God's going to do in our church and our lives, and, and I see only this is going to strengthen us and not weaken us. This is not the end. This is a new beginning. Let me read verse 19 one more time. But I know that through your prayers and God's provision, and you, you see the connection, through our prayers, as we seek the Lord, as we ask Him for daily bread, that, that God's going to provide. And, and let me just ask you a question. In these last 10 days, two weeks, when things begin to shut down in your life and your family, you miss any meals? You uh, not having your needs met. Uh, yeah, yeah. Th th there's some new crisis, uh, trying to keep the kids apart from fighting and, and trying to keep the kids from being bored and trying to keep the kids off of their iPhones and off the Internet and their Facebooking and all of that. But, but yes, th these are different times. But these could be great times. These could be important times and growing times. And we also know that, that uh, in life we've seen that before goodness, there's oftentimes brokenness. Before you can build a house, there has to be some, some trees broken. Before you can plant a seed and grow a crop, the ground has to be broken. And sometimes God breaks us. And I've heard it said over and over again. And I, I remember early in my ministry when God called me to preach, and, and I'd heard some of the older preachers say to me, says, Dan, God can't use you till he breaks you. And he does. And maybe God wants to use this time to break you. You're, you're not in control. I'm not in control. I don't push all the buttons. Life's not the same these last few weeks. But God is reminding me that my faith, our faith is in him and him alone. Our confidence is not what we can do, but what Christ can do in and through us. We, we see that in Scripture how God breaks his people, how sometimes God's people are in prison, just like Paul. In the Old Testament, Joseph, uh, he finds himself in prison, Potiphar's wife falsely accusing him of sleeping with her, and, and now he's in prison. And yet God uses those prison days for Joseph that, to prepare him to be a savior for his people and and really to save the world of, of famine. 
I'm reminded of John Bunyan. <coughs> John Bunyan was in prison, and, and yet he writes Pilgrim's Progress. Martin Luther, he too was in prison, and he translates the Bible into German, his New Testament into German. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, out of his prison comes the cost of discipleship in his writings. And how can we not forget John on the Isle of Patmos? He was broken. He was alone. And yet God allowed him to see things that no man had ever seen since. He saw what the future is going to be, a new heaven and a new earth. And so this morning we see in Philippians chapter 1, these last few verses, and we see that Paul's teaching us that, <clears throat> yes, uh, life has a way of shaping us and who we are. And Paul speaks of the external, those things that happen to us. He speaks of the internal, <clears throat> those things that are happening in us, but also he he speaks of the external and the eternal, those things that happen through us. We can't control everything that goes on around us, but we can control what's in us and through us. A couple of years ago, a good friend of mine, Mike Stanford, <clears throat> Mike and Kathy Stanford owned Fox Pool here in South Oklahoma City. Mike was experiencing kidney failure. He was preparing himself to be on dialysis. He was waiting for a, a kidney transplant. Come to find out that one of his brothers was a, an exact donor that they could use one of his kidneys, and his brother gladly gave a kidney for his brother. And I remember talking to Mike and visiting him in the hospital before he went into surgery that morning, and and Mike reminded not only me, but all his family who was there. He said that, listen, this is win-win. If, if this transplant works, to God be the glory. I, I'll continue on and, and I'll go on about my life and giving God great praise. But if this, trans, this kidney transplant doesn't work, that's okay because I have the promise of heaven. And, and, and what faith, and I remember there praying with Mike and holding his hand, praying together, and, and guys, rather than me comforting him, he was comforting me, and, and, and what great faith he was displaying that he was saying, listen, God's going to take care of me. If he chooses to heal me, I'll serve him and praise him. If he calls me home, that's going to be a win for me as well. God's in control. Keep your eyes fixed on him. I pray this morning that you can say as the Apostle Paul, my confidence is in Christ and Christ alone. Let's pray together. <clears throat> this morning as you're listening, let, let me ask you a personal question. And, and I, I, I know at this time, especially right now that we're experiencing that there's uncertain days and we do think about our mortality. We, we do think about, well, perhaps uh, you know, with Will life end soon for me? And, and that, that's just natural for us to think that. But listen, my friend, you don't have to live in fear. Jesus stands at your heart's door and knocks. And if you've never invited him into your heart and your life, let me encourage you to do so right now. This could be your new beginning, your new start in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That simply means, my friend, that Jesus waits for you to invite him into your heart. He'll not barge in. He'll not rush in. And so this morning, if you've never trusted Christ, let me encourage you to do so right now, this very moment. And, and pray this simple prayer. Just say, dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner. Jesus, I believe you died for my sins. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Thank you for saving me. I give you my life. And I'm going to do my best to follow you. The Bible tells us, friend, that when one person asks Christ into their heart, the angels in heaven begin to celebrate. There's a celebration going on right now just for you. 
If you prayed to receive Christ, let me know. You can get in touch with me. You can call my cell phone at 245-9309. I'd love to hear from you. And I'd like to, love to celebrate with you if you've given your heart to Christ. Church, let's stand firm together in one spirit, with one mind, striving together in the gospel. We're in this together, and we're going to get through. Father, be glorified. Thank you for visiting with us today. Thank you for encouraging us today. I pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you, church. God bless your friends who are watching and listening in. We're going to go out singing. So, uh, hey, if you're in your living room, stand up. Let's sing together. Great is thy faithfulness with Doug.